Thank you, Corral, the City Council. Hey, everybody, uh, welcome to the nice meeting of Greenville City Council. It is a beautiful day in July, so everybody take a deep breath, take a deep breath, and enjoy the fact it's still summer. Okay, good. Welcome to our new domain here at uh, at the conference center. I feel now rise for uh, invocation by council member John DeWorkin, and that'll be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Mayor. Please bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and for this opportunity to serve the citizens of Greenville. Thank you for all the leaders that have shown up tonight and all the leaders that are in our, in our community for all that they do. Um, I just want to uh, thank you, Lord, for people like Lillian Fleming, who have spent their lives serving this community. And uh, want to also particularly take this time to uh, say during these summer, summer months, please keep a lookout for our young people uh, as they venture in this world without necessarily the structure of bricks and mortar at school uh, and that they uh, make it through the summer uh, well and back into the school year. Uh, Lord, we thank you for all our many blessings. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you very much. Clerk will call the roll. <clears throat> Council Member John DeWorkin. Here. <clears throat> Council Member Lillian Fleming. Here. Council Member Ken Gibson. Council Member Will Brasington. Here. Council Member Russell Stahl. Council Member Dorothy Dow. Okay, she's not online yet, sir. And Mayor Knox White. All right, okay. So Dorothy's not online yet? Okay, here. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor, you have the uh, minutes of June 28th, which will stand approved as submitted, unless there are any objections. Seeing none, they are so approved. Uh, we have some special items on the agenda tonight. I just want to tell you how I want to do this. Um, I want to proceed with the recognition of our good friend and colleague, uh, Ms. Fleming. And when we get back to citizens addressing council, um, we'll, um, I'll, talk to, I'll talk at that time about whether we take some of the comments uh, as we get to those items on the agenda or whether we do it up front. I'm just going to have to sort of assess that right now, but uh, that'll be... That'll be the intention because I know many people are here for some of the zoning items and and that kind of good thing too. Uh, on the front end, I do want to uh, recognize we have some former council members here for this special tonight. Uh, I was just handed this. I'm going. Oh, okay. Really, Dayton Walker, are you still here? My goodness, good to see you, Dayton. Thank you. Great to see you, uh, Michelle Shane, who is practically singly responsible for the fact we're meeting here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a good uh, ironic. Uh, Mr. Fred Carpenter. Back there. Okay, nice to have you guys with us tonight. We appreciate that very much. Um, it's really like a bit. Hmm? George, George, George Fletcher. Oh, George Fletcher. Okay, ask didn't ask have you on the list, George. George Fletcher, thank you for being here tonight as well. Billy. Billy Carpenter. Billy Carpenter too. Okay. Can can they all just stand just for me? Yeah, if you're a for, if you are a former member of council, could you stand? Yeah. Billy. Anybody else a former member of council? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. All righty. Uh, who's in charge of our up from the presentation tonight? Camilla? Well, Mayor, we have a wonderful video that our okay. communications department has put together, uh, recognizing the past 40 years of service uh, that we have received the city of Greenville from council member Lillian Brock Fleming. And okay. I believe we're going to show that at this time. Okay, and we're happy to do that. Again, I thought it was important that everybody be here to see this. We appreciate Lillian's long service, and many, many of us have lived with her all along the way. What a, what a ride it's been, too. Yes, Lord. I always remember that my father told me that whatever you do in life, always be able to have the ability to want to tell your children why you did it. So don't just do stuff just because somebody else did it. 
you know, have a reason and a purpose. We were concerned it took us almost 11 years to get ownership of some property to begin a process. And so now that we're on a roll, hello, now that we're on a roll, the city of Greenville is very happy, and I'm excited as uh, the council member representing this area that there are things that's being done for longevity, that people are now staking a claim and investing in this community. I love the porches because you know that most people who are 62 years and over, they want to have a porch so they can see what's going on. <laughs> And when I saw the porches, I said, hello, somebody. <laughs> the elderly people were sitting on the porch watching you when you came to school and when you went home. The process is still the same. The community will grow when the people pay attention and take care of one another. So what you have here is not just 18 units. What you have here is a vision of hope. <clears throat> One of the great things about Lillian, and I've been on city council a long, long time with Lillian and Brock Fleming, is that she has immediate empathy with whoever is appearing before the city or has an issue with the city. Um, because at one time, way long ago, she was that other person. She was the person on the outside, she felt, trying to get the attention of City Hall. And so she's never lost that touch. She always remembers, you know, that we're public servants. She just has a strong desire to to bring the community together. And thankfully, that's an attribute that's as relevant or even maybe more relevant today than it was 40 years ago. She's been through four decades on council. That's four decades of Greenville changing. Um, and as Greenville has changed, she has been true to her leadership style, but she has remained relevant because she's smart, she has a compassionate heart for people with problems, and she has a, a keen mind to come up with solutions for these problems. Uh, she's a visionary herself, and she never meets a stranger. And so that's 40 years of relationships. <laughs> We want to present these to you as honorary citizens because you have made Greenville very proud, but you brought economic development and family entertainment, which is wonderful. And so you have given us something that will be historical and that people will always know that Greenville, South Carolina exists. And so we thank you and we applaud you and we want to give you a Greenville welcome. This is exciting. This is Mr. James Lafkin. He is 100 years old, the oldest resident of District 2 for Greenville City Council. And he is going to receive our very first recycling can. Uh, Lillian's always been a, a good positive voice on the big projects that the city's known for, whether it's a peace center, uh, baseball in Greenville. And make no mistake about it, you can hear from me that we would not have a downtown baseball stadium without Lillian Brock Fleming. Fundamentally, without Lillian and her advocacy for the West End and what this ballpark represents, floor field does not exist today. So, I mean, she was just instrumental to its very beginning, and she had a very strong vision as to what this ballpark meant to the community and what it meant to the city. At the crucial moments in time, I mean, she was there to be the great defender and supporter of moving the stadium downtown. Without any question, she was the pivotal person on that. Uh, when we were at the groundbreaking for what is today Floor Field, and she had a shovel in her hand, and I'd never done this before, and she put the shovel in, and she said, this is much more than about baseball. And... I wasn't totally sure what she meant at the time, but uh, what she really meant was the ballpark was about baseball, but it was also about economic development. It was about jobs. It was about bringing the community together and really everything that Lillian stands for and hopefully the drive has come to stand for in this community over time. The Hampton Avenue Bridge was one of the first issues that I heard about that concerned Lillian for her side of town in her district. And so it was important for the connectivity of Southern Side and the people and 
those who walked and biked and didn't have public transportation. She was a galvanizer for the community. We had a march, you know, and that's something she does well from a grassroots perspective, bringing everybody together. And we marched 1.5 miles to show the critical need for this bridge. And she was right there in the heart of it, but uh, we were able to do it. And she was just so instrumental um, in helping bridge the gap, so to speak. This is a good looking thing. Woo wee! Irrespective of what's going on, the city of Greenville, the council members have repeated over and over again, voted on behalf of making sure that people have a safe place to sleep and to live and to do every day. I thank you for that. With Lillian's leadership, the city took early steps in the area of affordable housing. And she talked a lot at that time about home ownership and the importance of home ownership in terms of the stability it brings to a neighborhood. And so she played a huge role in what is now the emphasis of the city in, in neighborhoods and listening. Uh, I think one time she said at a meeting, you know, you shouldn't have to shout to be heard at City Hall. We're going to put a little dirt in the ground, but it's just a symbolic gesture of a lifetime of service that this particular house will do for this particular community. Um, she has that ability to cut to the heart of an issue and speak truth to power. Uh, and you need that type of individual. You need her history uh, as we sometimes in government revisit issue after issue. I think it was Lillian who shared with me. She said, Chandra, every 10 years you talk about the same thing. You revisit an issue. And I, now I'm beginning to live that out in my service. And so, um, you know, you need someone who is there to kind of show you the way sometimes um, and let you know that the sky is not falling. Um, and to say, folks, we can do this. She says that all the time. Folks, we can do this. Our day-to-day -day interaction with, with residents in the city and making and making sure people feel like the city government is on their side, that we have everyone's back. Uh, it's she, She's a huge part of that. I think no one ever questions her integrity. No one ever questions the fact that she's on their side. Lillian has always been someone with a big heart, a good brain, and she can represent not only her district well, but the city of Greenville very well. And she has done that beautifully. Greenville needs uh, more Lillian Brock Flemings. Forty years and counting. Thank you. Well, we put that together. They were really good, weren't they? I've had to say it. It take time. 40 years to condition to a few minutes. Hello. That's, That's right. all right. Yeah. I just wish my mom was living. Yeah, yeah. For those that don't know her, Lillian's mom was a huge part of this community too, the city, and Lillian stepped in her footprints very much, but it has gone on from that point. Just a great thing to see. I'm, I'm glad to see things. We've got a lot of people, even this audience, who've only moved to Greenville a couple of years ago, and a lot of there's a lot of water under the dam. You know, we didn't get where we are just by looking at problems and saying, "Well, hope that goes away." Uh, <laughs> we got in and did things, and how it's transformed the city. And that you was know, a good history piece for everybody to observe. And you were such a huge part of it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Being patient is got to be patient. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be patient. Yes. And right. they are following this event. We do after the meeting. We do have a reception, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. that is available for everyone who's here to attend and uh, congratulate council member Fleming on her tenure and uh, to share with her a few words if they'd like to following the meeting. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> what we're going to do uh, on the item number seven, I'm going to take some items of people who are not speaking on zoning matters, uh, just the other matters, and then we'll come back to the uh, zoning matters when we get to those items on the agenda, which actually I think helps promote discussion in terms of next steps better than doing it the other way around. So, that's and Mayor right White, now. may I ask that we approve the minutes before we move forward? I've already approved them. Oh, yes. Do we yeah. have a motion? Okay, we approve those. Thank so you, they sir. Are approved as submitted, yeah. Thank you. Now, Camille, I've been doing that for 20 years. You know how I do that. <laughs> how did you miss that? Okay, we have a few folks who signed up to speak to us tonight on some matters uh, not pertaining to agenda items, um, and I'll take those at this time. Uh, Ms. Compton, Jessica Compton, hi. We apologize that we're so far away. We're still kind of working on the logistics in this room. I feel like I can barely see you. Well, I'm here. Hello. Okay, thank you. <laughs> When drivers, cyclists, and pedestrians stop on red for both stop signs and stop lights, everyone wins. As we uniformly prioritize safety, we minimize accidents, and we also create a thriving community where people respect each other and can freely move via a variety of transportation modes. My name is Jessica Compton, and I'm the director of Village Ranch, Greenville's community bicycle shop located in the village of West Greenville. I've witnessed the economic development of the village firsthand the last few years, and we can all see the way it's revitalized the area. Similarly, the Swamp Rabbit Trail has become an integral recreational asset to the city and county, a key feature of Greenville's myriad offerings for those seeking a healthy lifestyle. When I first moved to Greenville in 2017, I too was drawn to the running and cycling community. Now that I'm an avid cyclist myself, I know what a big cycling network we have here in Greenville. For both road riders and mountain bikers, the upstate is the cycling mecca of the southeast. I know lots of people who have moved here specifically to enjoy cycling in this area. Like PMAC, some of my friends here are going to speak after me. At Village Ranch, we promote a community culture that celebrates riding bicycles. One focus of our nonprofit youth program is teaching teenagers to be safe and confident bike riders. The very first riding lesson we practice is playing the bicycle edition of red light, green light, ensuring that students know how to use their brakes and stop when necessary. In a car dominant society, riding a bike is only as fun and life giving a form of exercise as it is safe. Though I'm proud that Greenville is considered a quote unquote bike city, I know even more would be cyclists that won't ride anywhere beyond the 22 miles confines of the Swamp Private Trail due to distracted automobile danger. That fear fueled abstention is an unmeasurable loss to what our city and community could be. A healthy, economically thriving community develops in a snowball effect, and Greenville is a few revolutions in. The safer and more accessible the assets a city provides are, like the Swamp Rabbit Trail and B-Cycle Bike Share, the more robust the economy. A 2019 report finds that modest public investments in rail-to-trail networks within and between communities could result in an annual economic return of $73.8 billion. These benefits include access to safe and seamless walking and biking routes, improved health and social connectivity, new opportunities for economic growth and access to jobs, education, and culture. That soft cultural capital of a healthy community is invaluable, and it makes Greenville an even more attractive city for prospective young professionals and families who are considering moving to the area. Their potential disposable income is what will continue to drive Greenville's economic growth. Fantastic as the trail is, it, it's not I enough. Have to, I have to kind of, I'm sorry, I didn't sure find you have thing. three minutes, so you can summarize. So, uh, in conclusion, we need to be safe as bikers, walkers, and drivers everywhere and stop on red. Uh, and that's going to make a better Greenville and city for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Dixon, Anna Dixon.
Save a life, stop on red. My name is Hannah Dixon and I moved here in 2008 to go to Furman and I've been here ever since. I used to ride my bike, my bike for transportation and recreation daily all over Greenville County. For years, I rode almost every day from Traveler's Rest to Augusta Road to work. I love Greenville. Over the last five or six years, however, I've become far less comfortable biking on our Greenville roads. It's scary to be riding down the road and have cars blare their horns and yell at you simply for being on a bike. It's terrifying watching cars run stop signs and red lights, especially when I'm biking or walking with our children from PMAC, the after school program and summer camp that I run. Most of my friends who used to road bike now only mountain bike, largely because of how unsafe our roads have become. Over the last few years, my Greenville biking has mostly been limited to my daily commute within a five mile radius. At one particular intersection that I biked through at least twice daily, a car ran a stop sign and hit me as I was coming home from work last May. <clears throat> my husband and I are always extremely cautious at this particular intersection because we see cars run straight through the stop sign often. This time, however, the road was wet and even though I pulled my brakes hard as I saw the car running the stop sign, I ran into the vehicle as it came into my lane. I hit the car, I hit my head in the car, landed on my lower back, and the vehicle ran over my bike. My husband has been hit on his bike enough times now for me to know to call the police immediately, so I did. And when they arrived about 20 minutes later, the officer checked on us to confirm that everything was okay and we had exchanged insurance information, but did not write the driver a ticket for running the stop sign. 14 months later, I still have bad back pain and I can't run, swim, hike, kayak, or bike like I used to. We've been concerned about this issue for several years, but haven't really known what to do because solutions seem overwhelming. At the urging of friends and family, and with these two recent deaths in Greenville, we got to the point where we felt like we had to do something and start somewhere. Several people suggested creating a petition and going to speak at city council, so that's why we're here. We've received over 1,500 signatures on our petition, and I've heard even more stories since starting this petition of Greenvillians being hit by cars. We so appreciate your hard work on the Slow Streets campaign, and we need to continue to strive to make our roads safer for all, pedestrians, cyclists, children, and drivers too. If we have better enforcement of stopping at stop signs and red lights, I truly believe we'll have far less collisions. I often watch three, four, even five cars run through lights after they've turned red, and sometimes I even see police officers at these intersections, yet no one gets ticketed. I love Greenville and I want our community to be a safe place for all of us. I truly believe that if we work harder to enforce stopping on red, then we will all be much safer. Thank you. If I can ask, where, where was your accident? I'm sorry you had an accident. Where did, okay. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry about that, yeah. Uh, Bennett Dixon. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Bennett Dixon and I was born and raised here in Greenville. <clears throat> We're obviously living in an exciting time of growth. I'm especially excited to see the efforts being put forth by the city for, for pedestrian and bicycle accessibility. <clears throat> We've seen road diets like East North Street, new bike lanes, painted bike lanes, <clears throat> excuse me, a protected bike lane, new multi-use trails, new sidewalks in neighborhoods like Alta Vista, Overbrook, and North Main, the neighborhood slow zone campaign, and more. <clears throat> but as a pedestrian or a cyclist, there's still great risk in our city. When I was younger, my parents moved us from our house at the corner of Bird and Augusta after two separate cars crashed into the fence around our house. I remember a friend having to roll up on the hood of a car as he walked in front of Greenville High after school one day. The driver did not stop. These aren't new problems, but I can honestly say I've seen the disregard for stoplights and stop signs grow in the past five years. <clears throat> I pay a lot of attention to these things. I ride my bike to work and wherever else I need to go in the city daily. I constantly watch and study what cars do at traffic signals in order to prepare myself to respond properly and ride safely. I've been hit multiple times by cars and regularly get yelled at, honked at, and cut off simply for being on my bike. So I have to be alert and vigilant. I also run an after-school uh, program in summer camp in Poe Mill with my wife that she mentioned called PMAC. Almost every day we cross Pete Hollis Boulevard at Buncombe Road on foot or on bikes in order to go play at the only park within walking distance and to go play in the gym of a church we partnered with. It is at this intersection in particular that I have not only watched more and more people run red lights as the signals finish changing, but also blatantly blast through well after the typical last second. 
I have watched a car fly through at 50 miles an hour as I was already leading 15 children on bikes into the crosswalk. Another time, I watched a driver shrug her shoulders when I gave her a thumbs down while she ran the red light. 30 children were getting ready to cross on foot behind me. I have a 10 year old who holds on to me tightly while we while crossing as I reassure her that I have waited long enough to make sure that no one else is going to run the red light. Sure, we could load the kids all up on buses and drive to these places that are a half a mile or less from our facility, but fitness, being outside and getting to experience a great childhood in a great city are integral to our program. I've seen firsthand how bike lanes and pedestrian areas are protected in New York City and how they have lights shaped like bikes to manage bike movement effectively. I've seen three lanes of traffic stop without any lights or signs prompting them in Washington, D.C. so that I could cross a road on my bike. We should not have to say let's drive our buses because they are safer. Truthfully, I tell people that Greenville is my all-time favorite place to ride a bike. I also love that I can walk from my house to this TD Saturday market, sidewalk pizza, or Claire's Creamery on the weekends. The future of our cities will be measured in accessibility, not by how many cars we can get in and out daily. If we want Greenville to continue in this upward trend of greatness, then we need to raise awareness and enforce traffic laws in all parts of our city so that everyone may safely walk or ride a bicycle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Kiernett, if I'm pronouncing that right. All right, thank you. Good evening. When I was about 13 years old, my dad bought road bikes for my two older siblings and I. He taught us how to ride safely on the roads in Western North Carolina, making sure we understood traffic laws, hand turning signals, and general safety protocol and sharing the road with cars. He and my mom wanted us to experience exercise, independence, and love of the outdoors, and cycling encompassed all of these aspects. My siblings and I biked all over the county, both out of necessity of getting to our dentist appointments, piano lessons, or swim team practices, but also out of sheer love of recreational cycling. When we started driving, my parents drilled into us the importance of defensive driving and always looking out for cyclists and pedestrians. These are lessons I carry with me to this day. When I went to college on Lookout Mountain, Georgia, just a 15 minute drive up the mountain from Chattanooga, Tennessee, I took my bike with me. I biked along the ridges and in the city of Chattanooga frequently enjoying every moment of my outdoor study breaks. In May of 2015, I moved to Greenville, South Carolina. Greenville was and still is my dream city. I have fallen in love with this place and with the state of South Carolina. It is home. That said, when I moved to Greenville, I realized within a few months of biking to, to work and around town that I no longer felt safe cycling on the roads. I experienced cars almost hitting me, even if I was in a bike lane, people angrily yelling out their car window for me to get off the road, and even near misses from cars running red lights or stop signs. You don't ever forget the feeling of your body tingling all over from sheer panic at almost getting hit by a car. Because of this, I stopped riding my bike in the city. What about the Swamp Rabbit Trail, you might ask? The trail is amazing. However, I have noticed that there seems to be an increase of intense cyclists on the Swamp Rabbit Trail. These cyclists fly by, calling to children and families on your left. In light of the infrastructure and purpose of the trail, I find it confusing that elite cyclists are trying to use a family-oriented trail as a place to train. I believe they have migrated to a place where it feels safe for them, but in return, the Swamp Rabbit Trail is now less safe for families. This is a direct domino effect of our roads becoming more and more dangerous as drivers fully realizing that there are little to no penalties for reckless driving, make split second decisions with a blatant disregard for traffic laws, hence endangering other cars, cyclists, and pedestrians. Greenville needs a major change. And I believe the change must begin with a new level of awareness, responsibility, and accountability for all drivers who frequent our city. We love Greenville and want to make it safe for all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Anybody on council want to respond to anything? Yeah. yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, first of all, thank thank you all for, for coming tonight. It, it really does make a difference and it certainly elevates the issue as we all have conversations amongst each, each other and, and staff. So thank you all for coming to speak. It, it really does matter and does make a difference. Um, as I was listening, um, I, I, was, I was thinking of a couple of weeks ago, Mayor, when we uh, decided to appropriate a quarter million dollars toward uh, bringing in a third party group that'll look at pedestrian safety. And I know it's not quite the same, uh, but what 
what was going through my mind, Mayor, was uh, uh, really hope, uh, hope that that is a step that will uh, yield uh, more safety for our walkers, for our cyclists, and may or may, maybe even, even even a more significant step toward uh, an elevated effort in, in addition to what we've already done, an elevated effort for the pedestrian and cycling safety. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Very t timely message. It has been a chief point of conversation in our, in our recent budget talks, and, among other things. So we appreciate that. All right, thank you. Um, let's see. Zoning, 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 zoning. Uh, Ms. Sarah, Ms. Uh, Sarah Villa. Thank you for letting me speak to you again. Um, I'm here about uh, the statues, the naked statues downtown. Uh, I said this in the last meeting, but the mayor wasn't here, so I just wanted him to hear this as well. A few meetings ago, someone mentioned the, the statue that's in the Peace Center, and the mayor pointed out that that statue is inside private property. Uh, well, this statue is right next to the window, and it's meant to see be seen by people outside. And um, I just want to say, if there was a man who went right next to that statue right now and undressed completely and posed just like that statue, he'd be he'd be arrested. And uh, to take this further, if anyone were to stand naked in their own home's window and purposely expose themselves to their neighbor's kids, they would be arrested. And if a woman were to go out to the park and dress and pose next to the statue of the hugging naked woman, she'd be arrested. And if a man were to undress down and, and put on a thong and pose like any of the other naked Wings of the City statues on Main Street or Falls Park, um, but let's just say he went and posed in front of an elementary school, he'd be arrested and he'd be called a perv and a pedophile. Uh, but let's say in each of these situations and these examples, the people explain away their actions as artistic expression. That excuse wouldn't work, but somehow these life size naked statues are okay. Why? There's no logic in that. And if you think it's okay because it's quote unquote art, consider that art like movies and TV shows have ratings. And you also have a choice to walk into a museum, but Main Street, Falls Park, the community as a whole is affected by this. What happened to common decency? You're allowing children to be exposed to this trash. You guys are old, and when I say that, it's not an insult. It's an expectation that you understand what decency is. You're smart enough to know that there is a moral issue here, not a simple issue of likes and dislikes. By allowing the naked statues to go up, you've positioned yourself as the authority over children's moral upbringing. And Instead of caring about morals, you're actively promoting perversion. And what you have done is deep shame to Greenville, and it feels like you don't care. Why are you allowing kids to be exposed to this? How can you toss aside morality? You know this is wrong. By the way, I'm wondering if you see the irony in your mission to make Greenville Cleanville. Let's pay attention and take care of one another. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Sharon Chenovov, Chenov, or I'm sorry. Okay. Sharon, I'm sorry. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Councilman, and guests. My name is Sharon Chonev, and it is my honor to speak with you today. Our group has come from throughout the state to share with you about a very exciting and important event that is coming to Greenville and to the entire state of South Carolina in 2022. The event is Violence of Hope. Allow me to take you back in time to the events of World War II. As you may know, Terrible atrocities took place during that ominous time, especially against the Jews during the Holocaust. When the war ended, most of Europe's Jews who survived 
made their way to Israel. Many of them were violins. These musicians no longer wanted to play their instruments because they have been forced to do so while watching their people go to the gas chambers. Many of the violinists wanted to throw away their violins, but there lived a violin maker in Israel by the name of Am Amnon Weinstein. He accepted and lovingly restored the violins so they could be played again. Our group is bringing 60 of these restored violins to South Carolina in April of 2022 for a month long tour that will include a series of concerts and educational events. The largest concerts on tour will be held in some of South Carolina's most prominent concert venues and educational events will take place in our schools, colleges and universities, while the violins will also be exhibited in um, museums and libraries. These events are of great personal significance to me. I am a descendant of two Holocaust survivors. My maternal grandparents were rescued from Hitler's death camps by valiant Bulgarian people who said no to Hitler and rescued all 49,000 of their Jewish population. This is why I stand here today. Our largest concert in Greenville will be held on May 3rd in McAllister Auditorium at Furman University. This performance will represent the hope which sprang up amidst the Holocaust. We invite you to witness the triumphant retelling of the rescue of 49,000 Bulgarian Jews through a large um, scale concert that will include children and adult choirs, Bulgarian vocalists, and a full symphony orchestra playing the violins of hope. These restored violins will release the sound of hope throughout South Carolina, sending the message of never again, tied with our state motto, while I live, I hope. Councilmen, we ask for your support in our endeavor. We invite the city to partner with us to help bring this inspiring and educational performance and events to the Greenville area. What an opportunity lies before us to train and encourage the next generation as we learn from history through the power of music. Our budget for the Greenville area is $200,000. The cost of bringing one violin to the state is $4,000. We are bringing 60 violins and world-renowned Bulgarian soloists, so together we may resound the sound of hope. Mm -hmm. We will present you with a packet which contains more information. Our team is eager to speak with you. Thank you for your time and for your support in advance. Well, thank, thank you. you. Work, That's pretty profound. Do you want to say a few words? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. Um, <clears throat> Uh, due to one of my former students, Monet, my fatten is here somewhere. I invited Sharon to come here. They came from Columbia because they're also going to do a presentation um, of, of Max and Trudy Heller, which I thought was appropriate uh, for the city of Greenville having since Max was our former mayor. And we look forward to uh, the program and, and they have information, and I've introduced her to the most important person in the city to get this information done, Angie Prosser. Because <laughs> I knew, I said, no, the mayor isn't the wrong one to talk to, sweetheart. I said, you can come up here and say a few words to him, but he's not the one that's going to do anything for you. And so Angie has already set up a time to get it done, and I hope all of you who are here who remember uh, the Holocaust and who remember all of the the, the things that are happening that will greatly support this musical and um, historical event that when it comes to Greenville. Wow. And we thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have an appointment to make, Councilman Gibson, and a recognition, I believe, too. Mm -hmm. um, my great pleasure to uh, recommend an appointment to Jackson Mills. Thousand dollars to be facing. Her great service. She's a great board member. Unfortunately, 
Kristen wants to get high demand elsewhere and receive a job offer down in the lower part of the state, so she's going to be moving down there. Um, but, but I believe that. Mm -hmm. Um, no, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't give him too many mics. I'm, I'm kind of loud. I think most people can hear me anyway. Um, but, but I think Jacqueline's going to be, would be a great replacement for her. She is uh, a teacher in the area. Uh, she, many people know her through her, the um, activities of her husband, husband, Reverend Stacy Mills. Um, I think she will be a great voice for the Greenville Housing Authority and, and one that will but will stand up for, for those who need their voices to be heard the most. With that said, I recommend her appointment to that. Okay. Yeah, I thought you'd take it on a kinder, gentler voice. I could really hear you. <laughs> uh, third time. We have Ms. Mills' nomination. Are there any others? All in favor of Ms. Mills, say aye. 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 Opposed, ayes have it. She is so appointed to the Greenville Housing Authority. Next is a consent, consent agenda. A number of items on the consent agenda. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. second. Motion and second. Clerk will call the roll. Council Member DeWorkin? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Gibson? Aye. Council Member Brasington? Aye. Council Member Dow? Aye. Aye. May Mayor White? Aye. <clears throat> consent agenda items are approved. We now move to the regular agenda. Uh, for, we'll take the, let's see, 14A, have some introduction, and then uh, we have a sign up on that, I believe. Yes. An ordinance to rezone approximately 3.87 acres of real property located on Lawrence Road and Ackley Road from R6 and C3 to PD planning. And a motion a second to so place it on the exact motion and, and a second. Uh, Mr. Graham, uh, and then I'm going I'm to take a comment. Is this on? Mm -hmm. Hello? Okay. I'm available for any uh, questions prior to the presentation. If not, I'll sit down and we can move to the presentation. Second and second and final. You want to do a presentation? Uh, certainly. So mm -hmm. what we have before you is a request uh, to rezone uh, properties that are currently zoned R6 and C3. It's some split zoning on some of these parcels uh, to a PD. Uh, the PD is proposing 112 units, all affordable housing at the 60% AMI level. Uh, the PD includes 6,500 uh, 6, square feet of commercial space, 4,000 square feet of amenity center included with 158 parking spaces. Um, just a quick highlight on the parking, the ordinance straight out would require 183, the LIHTC, uh, Grant that is involved in this project requires 145. So there is a compromise between the two at 158. Okay. I just have a quick question just, just for sure. we have one person signed to speak. I want to oh, I think yeah, I can get that first and then mm -hmm. um let me just do that. Mr. Uh Mr. Taylor Davis is here. Okay. Get you up front there. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Taylor Davis, the uh, president of MHE, one of the development partners uh, in this project. I wanted to thank all members of the council for this opportunity to speak about the planned development at Lawrence Road and Ackley. We are very proud of the team of local firms and developers that have come together for this affordable housing development consisting of 112 units and approximately 6,500 square feet of commercial space. We're proud of the concept that the team has put together and believe it will serve the community well for many, many years. Uh, our proposed development aligns very closely with the goals established in the Greenville 2040 plan, including mixed use development along transportation corridors, such as Lawrence Road. We believe in affordable housing development it will help serve the workforce needs of Greenville and help offer affordable housing options in the face of rising housing costs across the city and county of Greenville. Our current development strategy commits 100% of the units to 60% of area median income. This is consistent with our city's workforce housing needs. This type of privately owned mixed use workforce housing is a great way to respond to the city's housing challenges. Our team would be happy to answer any questions that you may have about the development. And thank you for your time. 
Okay. All right. Okay. Just okay. quick. Anybody? Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Quick, ahead. quick confirmation for Jay. My understanding is is that what we are approving today is the plan development part of it. But this project, before it's built, it will go back in front of the planning commission for any plans and, and anything like that to be approved. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That that's correct. The final development plan will have to go back for final approval on the architecture design. Okay, good deal. Um, and may I make a quick comment? Yeah. Right. Um, th this is this is in my district. Um, and and it's a there's a lot to like about this project. <clears throat> the first and foremost for me is the commitment to affordable housing, 100 units at 60 percent. Um, we we typically get a number of projects up here that are around the 80 percent level. Um, that is that is extremely difficult number for a lot of people, particularly in the Nickel Town community, where this thing abuts to make. Um, hopefully, with some help from from the housing authority, we can even get, get down into the 30 percent level to try to get some of those people in there. Another thing I like about it is that there's a is there's a true diversity in the development team in this. One of the principles of it is James Jordan. He's a minority developer, um, and I, I think that that I've spoken with James regarding this project a, a great deal from the very beginning, um, and and I think. The fact that there is diversity in the management also caused some things to happen along the way, which 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 are, I'm also very happy about. And, and primarily, it's that this development team reached out to the community early on, asked them what they liked about it, what they didn't like about it. I, I was present in some of those meetings. They um, the community sat back and told them these are things we like, these are things we don't. They made a great effort to try to change a number of those things. Um, and I think the project as it stands today is much better than it was before when, when it first started out. Now, with that said, there are two things on this project that I still have some concerns about. Um, one is the traffic or, or the proposed traffic that, that may be from this development. We're talking about 116 units with one, one source of ingress and egress. Um, I am concerned that that is going to 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 create a situation where we have a backup on Ackley Road. Um, I have spoken to the city staff about this, but I and I'm told that that they do not foresee it being a problem, and to the extent that it is a problem, um, that we can fix it through through changing of timing signals. And, and with that said, I, I will be holding city staff to to make sure that that happens. The, the other concern I have about this project, quite frankly. And Jay, I'm just talking. You don't you don't need okay. to stand there unless you want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other concern, because this is actually really more for Taylor Davis than it is for you. Um, the other concern that I have about this project is the the architecture. And, and my understanding is going to be going back before the planning commission to, um, and they're going to have a look at that. And, and my concern about that is this: this project. You guys really understand that this project is huge for that portion of Lawrence Road. It is the first major pro development of this size and type in that area, and it is going to set the tone for everything else that follows. So if it doesn't look right, if it's not done right, it's going to 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 either doom or bless that area with 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 whatever else comes forward, comes comes after that. So, like I say, it is extremely imperative that we in the city and you guys get this thing right. Um, I know it's going to be going back in front of the planning commission. Unfortunately, it's not going to be coming back in front of us for, for final approval, but I am not above going to the planning commission and, and letting them know if I have concerns about it. Um, but with that said, I support this project, but, but I want you guys to, to continue to look at those particular things. Okay. Thank you. And I wanted to second what Mr. Gibson said. Uh, the architecture is extremely important to us, but I was telling him I did have a chance to meet with Past and Smith, the architects, and I'm happy to say uh, that they're hearing us on that and there are some changes that are going to be coming to it. Uh, we're always glad, though, when we have a PD then somebody, that somebody goes to the trouble to put a good uh, vision, if you will, an image of what the project's going to look like. We're going to talk about that in another project in a minute. It's very important to do that. And uh, something we we really do insist on. So I appreciate they made a good effort on this, but I, I agree that it needs a lot of work on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from council? Anything else? Ready? Ready for a vote? Okay, we have a motion and second. Do we not? I thought you said somebody was supposed to speak. That was Taylor Davis. Oh, okay. He's the only one. It? Okay. He's the only one at this point. This has already been Reverse. subject to a lot of hearings, a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings, and a lot of meetings, and a lot of meetings. But 
at the end of the day, everybody kind of came together finally, and, and here we are today. So there. Okay, item 14A, clerk will call the roll. Council Member DeWorkin? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Gibson? Aye. Council Member Bresington? Aye. Council Member Dow? Aye. Mayor White? Aye. Received second and final reading. Thank you. Uh, new business 15A. An ordinance to rezone approximately 5.1 acres of real property located at 330 Pelham Road from RM2 to OD Office Institutional District. Okay. A motion to second, please. So moved. Second. Motion to second. Okay. Jay. Thank you, Mayor. Members of Council, uh, as you can see on the screen, we've got a parcel here on Pelham Road. That the applicant has approached to change the zoning to an OD zoning due to the uses that are being employed on the site. The uses are consistent with OD and uh, it is recommended for approval. Any other questions? First reading. No. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, it's a great location. <laughs> <laughs> okay, clerk will call the roll. Council Member DeWorkin? Aye. Council Member Fleming? Aye. Council Member Gibson? Aye. Council Member Brasington? Aye. Council Member Dow? Aye. Mayor White? Aye. 15A receives first reading approval. 15B. An ordinance to rezone approximately 4.51 acres of real property located on Academy Street, Perry Avenue, Calhoun Street, and Weir Street from RM2 and RDV to PD Development District. We have a motion to second to put this on the agenda. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Jay. Mr. Mayor, members of council, thank you. This is a, a more complex project, and we have a slide presentation for you. This application was formally applied for in August of 2020, and the Planning Commission considered this application the first time in November of 2020. A two person Planning Commission panel reviewed changes in December 2020. Staff and the applicant met at least three times in 2021 to discuss changes prior to the current proposal. Planning Commission voted on this application in May of 2021. Uh, next slide, Ariel. Yep. The project is a combination of 16 lots currently zoned RM2 and RDB. GVL 2040 future land use classification is urban residential and area suitable for missing middle housing. Next slide, please. Properties are mostly wooded. A tree survey has been provided by the applicant. The applicant is in the West End Special Emphasis neighborhood. A uh, neighborhood meeting was held in November of 2020 by the applicant. However, almost every meeting with the neighborhood to review the West End Small Area Plan or the regularly scheduled West End Neighborhood Association meeting has included much discussion about the Mosaic Development proposal. In addition, there's been extensive email communication. Next slide, please. Properties are about a quarter mile to Unity Park and the Swamp Rabbit Trail. Next slide, please. Projects composed of 16 properties. A few houses along Perry will be demolished to make way for the project. A five-story mixed-use building is proposed along Academy Street. This building will contain a mix of commercial, live work, and residential apartment units, and a two-level parking structure will be provided to serve this building. A three-story residential building is proposed along Ware Street. The first and second floor will be townhouse style units and the third floor will be a separate apartment unit. Off street parking will be provided to serve these units. A total of 32 townhouse style buildings are proposed along Perry Avenue and the in internal drive. Each unit will have its own parking garage. Total of 220 parking spaces are provided on site. Um, planning staff uh, estimates that 230 parking spaces would be needed to serve the entire development under traditional development standards. Um, however, this is also uh, going to include uh, affordable housing units. So there was a decrease in the plan development uh, to accommodate that. Small green space at the center of the site will be provided at the center. Um, a minimum of 0.61 acres of open green space would be required under the traditional development. The applicant categorized the total open space areas, either active or passive green space, active meaning the triangular piece is active, but there are other green space around the site. Uh, for a total of uh, 1.16 1 acres, 
uh, of which 0.47 is uh, designated as that active green space. Parking for the Academy Street building will be provided through a two level parking structure. Uh, one level will be underground and only accessible for vehicles using the Perry Avenue Ware Street entry. Uh, the upper level will be a surface grade uh, parking uh, space and only accessible from North Calhoun Street. Total of 114 parking stalls will be provided in the parking structure and these spaces are intended to serve the 80 apartment units, the two live work units, and 1,335 square feet of commercial space. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates the scale of the buildings in relation to the site and adjacent properties. Note the scale of the Academy Street parking structure. Note the step down provided on the Ware Street residential building, and then note the scale of the townhouses on Perry in relation to the adjacent residential homes. A total of 133 units are proposed the applicants proposing that 20 to 25% of these units will be affordable uh, in the 80% AMI or lower. The Academy Street building will be composed of 80 apartment building, uh, apartment units, two live work units, and 1,335 square feet of commercial space. The Ware Street building will be composed of 19 dwelling units. Six of the 19 will be top level flats. Perry Avenue will be fronted with 12 townhouses and the internal drives will have 20 townhouses. Next slide, please. As far as density goes, this slide breaks down the residential density that is proposed zone into three different zones with different densities. Uh, zone A, which is fronts on Academy Street and is currently zoned RDV, uh, proposes 82 units, which factors out to be about 61.7 units per acre. The Ware Street proposal is uh, number B there. Zone B, and that works out to 22.6 units per acre. And then zone C is where the townhomes are located as we move deeper into the neighborhood, and that is proposed at 13.7 units per acre. Currently, the neighborhood is zoned RM2, which is a 20 unit acre uh, by right. Next slide, please. Setbacks and buffer design include 15 foot buffers uh, provided around most of the site as shown in this slide. Four types of buffers are provided. And uh, if you want more detail on that, we can provide that. But in summary, the difference is the types of vegetation, et cetera, proposed. Next slide, please. Uh, planting types in, in each of the buffers are specified. Uh, fire truck, delivery truck, and trash truck access has been provided. A Sutera system will be used for the Perry Avenue and Ware Street units. A tree survey was provided in the November 2020 application. However, in January 2021, the city adopted a new tree ordinance and the new tree survey requirements were put into place. Staff has informed the applicant that the tree ordinance will apply to this project since formal approval hadn't been received. The applicant provided an updated tree survey last month. Slide, next slide, please. So the design review board was supportive of the project from a design perspective during this review in 2020 and their comments included removal of coastal architectural styles from precedent images, using lower transparent fences and front yards, simpler building forms may be appropriate for the smaller scale townhome units that front Perry. Uh, they desired to bring detail between all the unit types, uh, which is going to be covered with the FDP. And then finally, they noted that care should be taken to ensure that any green structure screening on the garage remains green in the long term. That last comment was a derivative of the first proposal that was made in uh, 2020, and the garage was completely redesigned, and the green screen is no longer part of the proposal. Uh, the Planning Commission yeah, recommended. Excuse me, Mr. Graham, I was confused. About something you said, you're going so fast here. Sure. Did you say design review board? Okay. They they review all multifamily projects as a courtesy prior but, to going. But there's to the no. Planning commission. What would they have been looking at? I mean, there's no. They review design. There, where's the? There's no design. But there was the massing uh, that was Just the massing, and then they had an idea board or a vision board. Okay, well, yeah, at we that can, time. Okay, we want to revisit that. Sure. But I, my understanding, I haven't seen. I haven't seen a design for anything. Well, it's, it's uh, again, the slide that we looked at that was the massing model. It was just a massing model. That's pretty much what you've got oh, well, that's combined not, with a vision board. And that, then the final design is that's not, a, the final that's not a, plan. That's not, that's not a design. Okay, go on. Sure. Uh, so um, 
The planning commission did recommend to approve with staff comments and conditions while also adding a site connection requirement along Ware Street. And staff is recommending that if approved, the final development plan for the project be reviewed by the planning commission. And with that, staff is available for questions. Okay, we have a number of folks who signed to speak to this. I do want to, um, I was asked a question coming in here. I just want to ask what, where, whether it's the first reading or second reading, how that works. This is a first reading. Uh, we don't have a second reading opportunity until August 6th, 9th. August 9th, by the way, so we, we have additional weeks due to vacation and such. So just to put that in context between what we talk about tonight and what could happen on August 9th, there's a good bit of space in between for further for people to have further discussions, which I just want to note in this case, it's a little unusual to have that much time, but that's a, that's probably a good thing. Mr. Um, Mayor, we feel questions first with Jay or, or public Well, you can ask, um, I, I won't. Well, go ahead now if you want to ask Jay a question, but I want to get to the chance for the folks to, to speak. Yeah, if, if, if you'll indulge, if it suits uh, council, just two questions real quick to clarify things you touched on. Um, do, do I understand correctly, Dare you to suggest that at least the portions of propo proposed development that sit off of Perry and where what's before us is of a lesser density through the rezoning than what could otherwise be attained in its current zoning form? Yes and no. Um, the one on where is a higher density because the density by right for this entire parcel, be it RDV or RM2, is 20 units an acre. So B and A both exceed 20 units an acre. C is less than 20 units an so acre. So the where is less dense. Uh, where is more? That's that's where, correct. Where is yes. Where Street is uh, Zone B. If we can, yeah, there you can see there. Uh, where Street is Zone B, and Zone B is 22.6 units an acre. So that's 2.6 units higher than what is allowed by the current zoning. My second question: um, We enjoyed a site visit, boots on the ground, a couple of weeks ago, just to understand the intricacies of, of this entire you know, parcel layout especially around the triangular open space screen area. Um, there are a number of gorgeous trees, and I expect we'll hear some voiced interest in those trees here when public comment starts up. You mentioned that with the applicant recognizing the start of the tree ordinance July 1st. Correct. Um, has there been the opportunity to measure each of those trees by the resubmitted survey to determine which meet the new heritage tree? Definition? There has. There's approximately 10 heritage trees that have been identified. So are, they, are they clustered largely in that space I just described between Perry and where? Are they approximately six of the 10 are actually within a proposed building footprint, but the other uh, four are outside of a building footprint. They're really more in the triangular space. And uh, so that, that's where they're located throughout the site. So you do have a cluster in the triangle space, and then the other six are spread out, but they fall within some uh, proposed building footprint. Thank you. So will they be torn down? We, uh, well, uh, it was a good question. We'll probably get into that too later. But um, it, unless we choose not to let anyone do that, um, okay, we can certainly add that too for that discussion purposes. All righty. I know some folks patiently have waited for us to get to this item on the agenda. Um, please be mindful of the of the three minute <clears throat> three minute clock rule, and um, we're anxious to hear people's concerns. We've certainly received a lot of emails, and I just want to know the council has since considered all these points and what's been sent to us on email. And um, we all have a lot of questions ourselves, but at the same time, we're here to identify, kind of focus in on what the issues really are and see if we can't uh, see some, some of those issues addressed, especially in the PD context. The great thing about a plan development, a lot of former council members are here. You may remember plan development. It's always kind of considered the gold standard. That is, you know, with the PD, I can tell you what color to paint your door. It's that exact with council chooses to do so. So uh, it's a, it's a good thing to have a PD normally. It's just that it's complicated to work through it and make sure you've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. But uh, usually it is considered the gold standard as opposed to just an open ended zoning. So that's a good thing to keep in mind as you raise particular issues about it. So with that, uh, let's see, Ms. Faust. This is just in the order of people, I guess, who's called in or something. So thank you for being here. Good evening. My name is Linda Faust and I live at 307 Perry Avenue with my husband and two small boys who are three and five months old. 
I'm here to ask you to consider denying approval of a rezoning request to allow for high density de development in my family centric neighborhood. When I moved to the West End neighborhood, I thought it would be a good place to have and raise children. I liked that I would be able to walk to the Montessori school only a block away. The amount of growth I've seen in just five years, however, is unsettling and has me questioning my choice of neighborhood. I have the safety of two small boys to consider. We regularly bike as a family, and I'm like many runners who choose to run along Perry Avenue as a cut through to the trail in Falls Park. The exponential increase in traffic that comes from a 20 fold growth, however, will turn relaxed outings and exercise into something altogether more daunting and more dangerous. And it will be even worse within the project with houses on top of driveways, roads, and too many cars. Will children actually be able to play on a lawn where there is no shade and there will never be any trees? Or will grown-ups be able to simply relax? The 2014 Westside Comprehensive Plan made child safety a priority. In the new comprehensive plan, those priorities have expanded to grow a green bill that looks to the future, protects our neighborhoods, green spaces, and allows our children to flourish. Until recently, the city told us the green space in the middle of this development would be our neighborhood park. Now it looks like it's mostly an ash asphalt drive. Families in the West End feel they have been robbed. Transforming that space into the opposite of a park will cement the curse of my neighborhood as the only one in Greenville without a park. The future park across Academy is not a neighborhood at park. As big and wonderful as it will be, children cannot cross a five lane thoroughfare to have a place to play when working parents like myself are unable to take them there. AJ Wittenberg is a blue star school and one that I am very excited to send my children to. However, I have concerns with the amount of high density development that are being considered in the West End that this school will quickly become like many other SC schools that are lacking quality teachers, adequate space and resources to ensure quality education is given to the future leaders of Greenville. It was a shock to hear that this development developer was entirely unaware what school jurisdictions would be impacted by this project. In the words of Rob Robinson, I want to keep the West End a family friendly cottage district, one where children can play and be safe. This development is not compatible with that, and I hope you vote to protect us from a high density development like the mosaic. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Powell. My name is Deborah Powell. And I live at 706 Rhett Street, and I've been there since 2007. Excuse me, 2014, seven years. Um, I brought this to help me be on point. I'm speaking today to the code of plan PD, uh, plan development. Um, I think we know what we're looking for. We're looking for exceptional design. We're looking for a design that preserves critical environmental resources and provides above average open space and recreational amenities. Um, this is to me very easy to see that St. Capital meets none of these requirements. There's a, a lot of sprawl if this little cookie cutter piece of parcel uh, with 16 lots. Uh, we do have a little bit of everything from townhouses to a monolithic parking um, uh, asphalt everywhere and a large building. So the city staff, we've asked specifically to state how this plan fulfills the requirement for exceptional design, and we have not had a response that is clarity. Number two, about preserving critical resources, thank you for speaking about our tree canopy. We are 19.4% tree canopy in the West End, according to Greenville quantifying. That's the second worst of all the neighborhoods in Greenville. Think of Augusta Road, North Main, think of everybody that has trees. And we're considering six out of 10 trees are heritage trees that are gonna be displaced, as well as taking the rest of the canopy and clear cutting. I think that the PD says that you know, those trees are a critical environmental resource source to preserve and not to uh, destroy. There are green spaces, mostly in the setbacks, if you look at the drawing. So if you take all of the setbacks and count those as open spaces uh, with concrete and asphalt, then, um, you know, you get a percentage. At recreational amenities, there's not even a dog run. We ask, what do you have for recreational amenities? and there are none, and agreed, it should be a higher standard, and we don't see any of these having been met. But the big elephant to us in the room is that when you hang affordable housing over top of a development, all of a sudden people get a little skittish to talk about what does this mean to the neighborhood. 
Nobody wants to say we don't want affordable housing. We want affordable housing. We want conscientious development. And this does not meet that. If you do the math, and I, I hope you will, um, the developer, the allowed density of 90, no matter if you put you know, more here or less there, the development would allow 90. And he's asking for 43 additional units in hopes to give us workforce discounts for 26 units. Uh, the developer stated at one meeting they can't earn the yields they are looking for unless they have 133 units where 90 should be. Um, you gave them a chunk of land for $10. So how much is enough? Are they building a, their brand or are they building affordable housing? All of these things, the opposite of exceptional design, the opposite of preserving critical environmental resources, and the opposite of affordable housing. We ask you to say no to this misplaced project. Thank you. How many people bring props? Thank you very much. Start a new trend here. Uh, Ms. Wallace. I'm actually speaking on behalf of uh, my friend Teresa and Brock Holmes. They had a family emergency, so she wrote this up for me to say. Oh. Um, she just purchased the house on 114 North Calhoun, which is a, like directly next to where this parking lot is supposed to be built, the two story parking structure. Um, so she owns a house that will sit next to Mosaic's main entrance and the huge parking lot that stretches not only the length of my property, but the length of the entire block. With a southern facing 65 foot tall apartment building, the direct glare, noise, car exhaust and loss of privacy won't just be nuisances. They will never negatively impact our health and quality of life each and every day. I've also been told the apartment dumpsters will be facing my backyard, which is not acceptable. I've heard they will be located underground, but I've also researched and noticed that if these are not properly maintained and the tops are not closed, they will smell and cause a rodent issue. So why as a single family property owner am I having to deal with the consequences of these thoughtless options? Please consider being in our shoes and having your home so close to a noisy parking deck and dumpsters. When I bought this property, I was told that I was going to have a nice green space in my backyard or next to me. And now I'm told that I have purchased this property and I have a two story parking deck and dumpsters next to me. So, um, along also along Calhoun, the streets are already compact and crowded for on street parking. This is going to be a huge issue, and I do not want others to park in front of my house. The light pollution coming and going, 700 plus household and businesses next door will negatively impact our health, sleep, and mental well being on a daily basis. Not to mention trash pickups, delivery trucks, and moving vans. I have to wonder if this will be some of the last times me and my husband, who's an emergency room physician, will get a decent night's sleep. By excavating just one level for underground parking, they could replace the eyesore parking lot, which will decrease home values with a true green space. They've already done the soil and core samples to get the okay for the underground stormwater tanks. It is not their priority, but I ask you, council members, to make it yours. There's a long list of city ordinances currently on the books designed to protect me and my neighbors, and I have these listed here to pass out to you. Um, one of the neighbors, um, so why are they being ignored? This is not just. It is mind boggling to me that I must come before you to beg you not to ignore so many established mandates. Please keep the public trust, protect me and those in the West End from such a bad neighbor, and vote down the Mosaic development. Thank you for your time. Do I need a pass? Um, can see. Camille can help you out there. Mr. Mayor, if I may, I'd, I'd like to compliment this kind lady for speaking on behalf of her neighbor. Uh, not everybody jumps at the chance to speak in public on a Monday evening. So I also live in the West End, but I'm on the other side of Pendleton. So this still kind of impacts that whole traffic area around that. So, but thank you. So I hope you consider that for my friend because she's a wonderful. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, Ms. Wolf. <laughs> so, my name is Suzanne Wolf, and I live at 200 Perry Avenue. For today's meeting, I brought three images. 
I appreciate the city staff and some of the city council members have walked our neighborhood to get an understanding of the project location. I think these images will help visualize the impact that, that the proposed scale and building forms will have on the existing homes and neighborhood. These images were also included in the email I sent to city council on Friday, July 9th. First, the five story apartment block. I don't know if I should just hold up ahead. This rendering shows the difference in scale and style between these two building types. It is obvious, it just does not work. The apartment block not only dwarfs the home, but 114 North Calhoun will be surrounded on two sides by hard surfaces. Also, that traffic that will be moving in and out behind it, an insufficient privacy fence and plant buffers will not be enough to keep the noise and light pollution at bay. The application indicates that this plan steps down from Academy towards Perry. However, scaling from five stories to two does not seem to be stepping down, but more of a drop off. Um, the existing typography also helps with the visual of a stepping down and is misleading. Please notice this during the developer's presentation, slide seven. The second image <coughs> is um, at Perry, uh, images from corner of Perry and Calhoun. At Perry Avenue, the building size jumps up from one story to three. It does not step up. This area of the proposed development has three story townhomes sandwiched between two single story detached homes. The row on Perry and the interior row of townhomes will loom over the bungalows on either side and behind. This is very disjointed and does not fit the cottage style of the area. The, this final image is from the Ware Street side of the development. Again, scale is an issue. The building size does not does another drop of, from three stories to one on Ware Street. Three story apartment building will tower over the single family home next door. The design is incompatible with the surrounding smaller homes. Also, the current design will contribute to the excessive surface parking and light pollution in the area. To conclude, we want affordable housing that is actually affordable. We want missing middle housing to create a transition between a cottage neighborhood and the downtown. We want house scale uh, building, not block scale buildings. We want the city to adhere to the existing codes and ordinance. We want a plan that fits the neighborhood and we want an open and transparent dialogue with the city and the developer. The mosaic is it, as it's currently proposed it will, is what we don't want. I wanna thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. I hope you found the renderings helpful and ask that you do not approve the mosaic project application. Thank you. Miss, um, yeah, soon mm -hmm. Ordway. Good evening. I'm Lois Ordway and I live at 213 Perry Avenue. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. And I thank you for that. Before I get to my talking points, I just want to re go back to the tree uh, survey done back in November. The uh, heritage trees, there are 24 of them, ranging from 20 to 60 inches. So they average 33 inches in diameter. The tree ordinance won't help save Greenville's trees as long as PD zonings exist to punch gaping holes in our tree canopy. Bully builds like the mosaic are maxing out buildings, driveways, interior streets, and parking. And when you factor in right of ways for utilities and underground stormwater tanks, replacement trees are pushed to the perimeter. All this means that only a handful of the handful of trees St. Capital is choosing to replace can actually be canopy trees. What we are left with is a four and a half acre permanent bald spot. When did the West End become a second class neighborhood, undeserving of critical environmental assets, green spaces, community identity and well-being? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the city has planted a single tree in the West End in the five years I've been there. Where are all these replacement trees going? Somebody else's neighborhood. Here I have more recent mapping than the city's own, showing us dead last in tree coverage throughout of all of Greenville. It's not redlining, but it sure looks like, and the current term is environmental racism. We are being forced to give up our neighborhood identity and key green assets for the sake of affordable housing. 
but the mosaic style of affordable housing is a complete mis misnomer, a bait and switch, even with 40% discount, 0 .6, I, 0 0.6 AMI tenants would get the two bedroom units here are still 100 to $500 more expensive than the rents next door. For every affordable unit, St. Capital creates two are lost in the rent squeeze, bringing escalated displacement to the West End too. The Planning Commission's actions make a mockery of the comprehensive plan and seem to ignore the existing land ordinance. If this project goes forward, it will turn us into victims. Decreasing the quality of the air we breathe, our sense of belonging, even our chances for success, while increasing the likelihood of health problems and the incident of crime and domestic abuse. You know, I've sent you 75 reasons to say no to the, why we say no to the Mosaic project. PD zoning in its current form will continue to be a zoning loophole, a neighborhood killer. Only the council saying no to this PD zoning change will save the West End neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thomas. Uh, good evening, Ian Thomas, 209 Perry Avenue. Uh, dear Honorable Mayor White and City Council representatives, um, I do want to say as a formal neighborhood representative uh, of the West End, I really do want to express my thanks and, and gratitude to Councilwoman Fleming for her 40 years of service. Wish I could have said this earlier, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's certainly overdue, and we have always appreciated your leadership and your representation on City Council for our neighborhood, but also for all of the District 2 neighborhoods. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, back to the rezoning um, regarding the 4.51 acres. Um, I've certainly submitted my information uh, via email. I provided my comments to the City Council, City staff, uh, as well as UDA regarding this project. And I'll, I'll try to keep my comments short. Um, if you do decide to, to vote yes for this project today, I really hope you will take heed of the comments that you've heard from the neighbors today. There's a lot of concern and a lot of issues that we have about this project. And before the second reading, if you do vote yes, I truly hope you will use your influence to bring the developer, the Greenville Housing Fund, who you support, and the neighborhood together with a third party such as UDA. And let's have a real meeting and let's see what type of concessions can be made to support the neighborhood. Because the project we see in front of us right now, we don't see how it is cohesive and how it interconnects with our existing community. Because we know when this is built, we're not just worried about us who live there now, but we're also thinking about those who will move into this neighborhood, who will be living in these rental units in five or 10 years. We want them to embrace and support the neighborhood that we currently have. The way it looks, it looks very disjointed. We know that the traffic flow pattern for the apartment complex, if you can't get into a parking space on the surface deck on North Calhoun, you have to drive all the way around to Perry Ave and then drive through the internal street to the below parking deck. That internal drive does not appear to be a public street where there's gonna be a lot of people on it, either townhome or apartment dwellers. We also know from a previous comments from uh, other uh, individuals speaking, we will probably see an, an excessive amount of people speeding through this area to try to find that parking spot, either on the parking deck or below. And we have a bike lane on North Calhoun Street. And I'm nervous that bike lane will disappear because of the excessive amount of cars coming in and out of that one way street for the parking deck entrance and exit. All I can say, um, at this time is if you vote yes, we need your help as a neighborhood. Bring these people to the table and let's have a meaningful, serious conversation that the neighborhood gets something out of this project because the current proposal, we don't see any benefits to the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What kind of hat are you wearing? Go try it. Okay. Oh, okay. Couldn't quite tell. Ready, uh, Cheryl Jenkins. Okay. 
It's so the founder of the neighborhood. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you. My name is Cheryl Jenkins. I represent a few properties that we own in the 300 block of Perry. I come before you tonight in opposition to this mosaic project. Many of you don't know me. Some of you may. My husband and I are builders and developers that have been working on the West End for over 10 years. We started on Memminger on Arlington and then in the 200 block of Perry. When we started out there, it was pretty rough. Run down, hoarded up houses, tons of trash, vagrants, drugs, theft, you name it. Most of our friends thought we were crazy, but look at it now. We have been involved in either renovation or construction of 25 homes on the West End, and I think we've done a pretty good job. We are so committed to the idea of community and neighborhoods that we put it on our company shirts. It reads, building homes, creating community, growing Greenville. How committed are we? We pulled away from a couple of extremely nice offers from QT for our property in the 300 block of Perry because we didn't feel like it fit the neighborhood in that location. In addition to that, we decided against tearing down some historical houses in the 300 block of Perry. The oldest one was built in 1902. We had planned to build 22 brownstone units on that site, but we just didn't feel like it fit. After much agonizing, an adjustment to our personal financial from the loss of 22 sales, we committed to build seven single family homes because it fit the neighborhood. For the most part, our vision has been in alignment with the city for the development of our neighborhood. It pains me to say that we are not aligned on this project. The density is far too high. Looking at the pros and cons, the cons are far too great for this proposed project. The neighbors immediately adjacent are being asked to swallow the idea of having huge mass and structures next to them. They're being asked to ignore the light and noise pollution that will immediately adjacent to their homes. They're being asked to wait an inordinate amount of time to get out of their driveways because of the increased traffic from the site. They're being asked to give up the greenery on that parcel and they're being asked to accept the fact that their improving neighborhood will be decimated. And for what? So a build to rent developer can make tens of millions more on extra units to rent for the next 20 years before their loans are forgiven and they can sell those units. We understand that this parcel of land is a blank canvas and that something will be developed there. We understand that the proximity to Academy raises the bar for density, then hold the density and raise building height to Academy, not to the interior of our single family home neighborhood. Leave the bulk of the existing green space to the interior of our neighborhood and creating good buffering. Our neighborhood has needs to survive and to thrive. We need diversity, cohesiveness, green space, and walkability. We need you, our elected officials, to hear our voice and help protect us from a siege of overdevelopment. We beg you to deny the zoning, which would allow this proposed density. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say a good word for Cheryl. Uh, everything she said is, is true. She and her husband arrived in Greenville over 10 years ago and chose an area where I think 90% of the houses were blighted, devastated, there were drug houses, et cetera. And they were crazy enough because they didn't know any better maybe. <laughs> to buy a house or two or three or four later the whole block or two so the entire neighborhood was turned around because of their vision um i think they just saw the west end village and they, on one end they saw the baseball stadium on the other and thought well maybe something in between might make sense so uh thank you for you know what y'all done for the last many years and and the folks who live in the neighborhood now are beneficiaries of this amazing research renaissance if you will in that neighborhood yeah good job on that um Okay, um, that's all who signed up to speak. I know we got many others, and I don't want to. I don't know if council members all want to speak, but I was trying to. I think I was taking notes. We're all taking notes on what you know what the main concerns are. And, uh, I thought uh, Ian, thank you for your comments. I thought those were very concise, and uh, and Cheryl, you're you're particularly at the end. Um, and I, I just wanted to focus on one issue. I think we got. I heard about three issues. I heard about scale, uh, especially those relationship of the of the build the townhomes relationship to the homes the, the single family homes that are existing on Perry uh, being out of scale I heard that issue very clearly and I want to talk about that well I heard mayor I I have a motion that we postpone um making a decision because it seems that there's more substance that can be done with uh, uh trees buffering and um 
when I heard them say that that it had gone to the design review, but it wasn't anything that people could physically see, no. then um, I think in light of all the, the problems and questions that I think we should postpone um, this and then get together and make sure we, as many of us can as possible, because I really do think that um, since they've changed it a couple of times, that they have the heart, they just need to know exactly what it is that can be done in that particular area and how it will negatively or positively impact the community. So I don't have a problem with postponing this particular item. Mr. Mayor, I second the motion. Okay, motion second, some more discussion. Uh, before yeah, we like to, okay. talk about that, let me, well, let me say a word or two. I forgot, Dorothy, I forgot you were there, I apologize. I'm uh, here, I'm here. I haven't had dinner, but I'm still here. <laughs> filling your, they're, you're filling the room with yeah, your personal. We're trying to so, uh, <laughs> appreciate we it. We got up at 3.30. <laughs> Remember, we can always cut the cord, so be careful what you say. No, I have some comments uh, whenever the right time is right. Let me, okay. Yeah. Just, just call wanna, me just if wanna, you won't let you talk. I want to say these things while they're on my mind. I'll forget about it. So oh, let me. Oh, uh, God. He's getting um, on. I know these a lot of these issues were discussed at the planning commission um, have, when I went back and looked at the minutes, but I don't think they dug in deeply enough, and I don't think they really challenged the developer to address some specific things. So I do want to mention scale issue, especially three stories instead of the townhomes on Perry, my view, for example, can be two instead of three. I think that's an important issue to address. We certainly need to see the design, and I, I'm sure I would think that I'm kind of I've been am surprised uh, that staff hadn't pull that out before because you've got to be able to know what these things look like. And the one thing about Perry, it does occur to me is that there's a definite, following on Cheryl Jenkins comment, there's a definite vernacular in Perry. This is not a street where you have to wonder what it ought to look like to fit in. Uh, you can see what things fit, what fits in and on, on Perry Avenue. So we need to see designs um, at another, at a much higher level and they need to fit in with the neighborhood. And that's not an unreasonable thing to ask at all. So scale, they need to be lower scale. They need to fit in with the design. And I guess the third one I heard is you mentioned the tree matter and I was inquiring today about that. I think, I think there are ways, I think there are ways if, they, if, if, if we have the will to make sure the heritage trees are preserved, almost all of them in fact. Uh, but I wanna identify all those trees and talk about if you design something, how you can preserve most of those heritage trees. I think based on some new information I got, I think it can be done. So those are three issues. I know there probably are some others well, um, I, I, that we wanna look at. Yes, yeah, Mr. Mayor, if I could, if I could just speak towards the, and I, I think they're all in the room, but um, first off, I do want to say thank you to the developer, Richard Jackson, who was willing to come to the table last week with the neighborhood. I had asked um, Brian Brown to reach out to him and to have them come together because I knew we were not ready to vote it at this point. Um, that meeting did not happen, and I know there was a reluctance to have too few members from the neighborhood. Um, I think it was rushed trying to do it during a holiday week, and I think we need to try again. I simply cannot unsee the fact that the UDA plan does not support what this density is showing. I know this permit came in after we hired UDA to do the small area plan for West End. However, Ian Thomas, as leader of that neighborhood, requested a small area plan in July of 2019. We failed as a council because it, it wasn't our priority and COVID came and there's only one Rob Robinson and thus the West End small area plan got kicked down the road and kicked down the road and I apologize to the neighborhood for that, for not seeing the house of cards that that was causing. Um, you know, this is a somewhat of a square peg in a round hole because of difficult geometry of the plant, the, the parcels that have been pushed together. Um, I know this neighborhood supports affordable housing. I know this community, these people want affordability and, and, and this has never been any kind of NIMBY debate. In my mind, they have been very supportive of affordable housing, but the plan as it is, was not recommended by our planning department to the planning commission. It was neither recommended for approval, nor was it recommended for denial because it did not meet what our Greenville 2040 plan has outlined for this area. And we know in another month or so, we're gonna be adopting a West End area plan that does not support this plan as it is right now. 
I really encourage the neighborhood to seek to come to the table with this developer and with UDA and with our staff. And I really encourage the developer to have patience to come back to the table to help <laughs> us come up with something that he can build and, and then I could support it. But in this current state, the way it is, it just isn't ready. And I appreciate Council Member Fleming offering up a postponement. And did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I mean, it. Since we're going to look at this thing again and make changes to what I'd really like to kind of see is, and I think some of the, the, the people in the neighborhood express this more affordable housing, more yeah. affordable housing units in that in that number. Um, 30, 33 is great, but, but, you know, yeah. more than that would be even better. So, like I say, if we're looking at it again, let's look at what we can do on all aspects of it. And one of the things that we need to take in consideration since the developers, since if we're moving them, et cetera, that if we're committed, we have to be committed in more ways than one, uh, in helping the neighborhood. We can't just ask them, um, to sacrifice something and then we don't. We don't put in and do what we need to do. The one thing I do want the neighborhood to know, I appreciate you coming because I said to you over and over again, every time I met, say what you feel, tell people where you want to live and how you want to live. You don't want your, your front porch messed up like nobody else's front porch. But one of the things I do want you to know is all the commercial things that are coming there. Cheryl's already told you she's turned down QT. They won't be the only one that's coming. You already, we already had a problem when we had the Burger King. So I'm just saying, please, if housing is what we need more than we need all the other commercial development, let's work together to get something that will, that will thrive in that neighborhood and that will look good. And I know we can do it. And I appreciate y'all coming. While, while we're in this period of comment and discussion, before we take a vote on the motion before us, I, um, my thought that I'll say, particularly to our planning department, but also to members of council, I mean, we're, we're considering a PD plan development, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And so if and as we consider it tonight or in the future, and for all the plan developments that will follow, I think it was Ms. Powell that pointed out that some of the characteristics that are supposed to be, you know, ever present and clearly detectable in a plan development are above average open space, mm -hmm. exceptional design. I think there's others. And Personally, I, I want to see us, however we get there, get to a point where when a planned development proposed rezoning comes before really anybody giving consideration, but particularly council at final vote, mm -hmm. um, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's crystal clear and it's right in front of you that this is exactly what is meant by exceptional design and above average open space. And you know, I'm, I'm eager to vote on tabling because in my mind leading up to this, with that being the litmus to measure this on, I don't know how I could vote yes in its current form. So I want to charge all of us involved in the process as it goes through the motions to arrive at that point where you can present to any audience that says, here's why this is deserving of a PD designation. Well, I remind council the next meeting is August the 9th. 9th. August 9th. August 9th. So if this is going to be deferred to August 9th, uh, I don't think we should say we're going to just start the work on August 9th. I, I, we, need, we need people of goodwill and willing to get in there and get and work on some of these identified issues of the scale of the design of the tree canopy. And, and they, have, they have neighborhood have a plan. start anytime. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I'll be a lot more direct in my comments. Um, there, there is a wide gap between the neighborhood and this development and um, you need to get together and sit at a table and figure this out. Um, you know, I, I look at, I look at where multifamily meets, uh, single family. I look at where commercial meets neighborhoods and it's a marriage. You know, neither party should have carte blanche control over the other. It's a real marriage. Not all marriages are made in heaven, but certainly this can, it is a lot like a marriage where you've got to sit down and talk about, uh, try to figure something out. Uh, so that when we come back, when this comes be back before council, there's been a lot of ground plowed. Uh, and so it is my hope that that you all will sit down with each other. That is the developer and the neighborhood and try to figure some of these things out. Well, let me and I should add, Mr. Mayor, I'd, I, I don't think the motion was set for a date certain of August 9th. 
Nope. I mean, that, that's where we got into trouble with with forcing the meeting to July to, to last Friday. I mean, Mr. Jackson flew back from Aruba from his family vacation only to find the meeting had been canceled. It was rushed. Take the time to come to the ta and by the way, thank you, Mr. Jackson. Take the time to come to the table. Have UDA present, have staff present, have the neighborhood present, have the developer present. And let's yeah, get this I, right I, before I it back. A, a decision points by the, that date necessarily, but I mean, we're going to, we're not going to let it sit on the shelf and. And wonder on a, on and August wait 9th. Come back and say something. Yeah. Okay. okay. I hope we'll, um, Mr. Manager, I hope, um, in view of this, that, uh, you'll help us in terms of. What role the city staff plays and who plays that role. In pulling this together, I think that's very important. I don't expect folks just randomly to come together. I think we need to, to lead on that if that's the case. Okay, we had a motion to defer. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, aye. I have it. Okay, thank you. We have one more item on the agenda. Get to it. We have one more item, 16A. A resolution, a resolution to approve a structural encroachment permit for Big Al LLC to install stoops and planters located on its property at 1211 Pendleton Street, which will encroach onto the public right of way on Burdett Street. Okay, do have a motion, please? So no. move. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Good Perfect. luck, Clint. <laughs> Very persuasive, Mr. Mr. Lee. Uh, Yo, Mr. he's Manor, already talked about a, it. Do you have any comments, Ms. Manager? We, we started at oh, three. Yeah. <laughs> we started at three o'clock. So all the former council members, Thank I want you to understand. You really, Thank you. you really now. What were you doing at three o'clock this afternoon? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Wait a minute, I want to recognize my children. I know oh. some of them are here, but my my husband is over at County Square with Chandra. So, a reception first. next door. Okay, next door. My children, where y'all at? Oh, there back you go. in the there back. Man, you all invited to that Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Okay. Seven eighteen. Come to the reception. Oh, thank you. Listen.